Hey everybody, welcome back to another very exciting episode here at the Photoshop Training Hour. I am your host, Jesus Ramirez. Thank you so much for being with me today. I already see some people in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, Locklish Plays. By uh, He said, you know, this is going to be something excellent before you even watch it. That's why we're already, that's why I've already liked it. So thank you so much for liking the video. If you enjoy any anything that I show in this stream, feel free to like that button. If this is your first time at the Photoshop Training Channel, then feel free to subscribe. Thank you so much uh, for being here with me again. Um, this episode, like every other episode, is sponsored by our good friends at MSI. Thank you so much, MSI, for sponsoring this video. And also, a little later on, I'll talk a little bit about the MSI software hardware that I'm using. I'm using an MSI laptop as well as an MSI monitor here and an MSI desktop, which is what I'm using to stream this event. Today we're going to discuss Photoshop brushes. They're a very exciting feature in Photoshop. There's so many cool things that you can do. And what I'm gonna do is th start at the very beginning, the most basic things about brushes, how they work, and we're gonna work our way up and see how far we can get with more advanced features. I will be using a Wacom tablet in this stream, but if you don't have one, that's okay. Most of the things that I'll talk about apply to a mouse. In very specific instances, um, there will be settings that only apply to a Wacom tablet, but I will mention that in the stream. And if you don't have one, that's okay. Just maybe 5% of the things that I talk about will be specific to a Wacom tablet or any other tablet. But yeah, let me just look at the chat. And yeah, thank you so much, Louis, from California. I'm in California as well. I'm in the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. Let me know where in the world you're watching from. I always like to see where people tune in from. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. It is 1.30 for me here in California. We have people from Michigan watching. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, happy Friday, by the way. I hope everybody's having a good Friday and that you have a wonderful weekend. So why don't we jump right into it? Um, I'm going to share my screen and here it is. And it looks like I have part of my second mic here so I'll just move it to the side so it's not visible and it doesn't distract from the stream there we go and yeah so you can you should be able to see Photoshop and like I said we're gonna start right in the beginning and what I want to show you guys is what a brush actually is so I'm going to select the brush tool and from this drop down under general brushes I'm just going to select this hard round brush and I'm going to paint so there you go, I just I just painted with the brush. So what is actually going on here? Well, let's take a look at it. You can go into the brushes panel by going into window and selecting brushes or brush settings rather, that's where I wanna go into the brush settings. And from here, you can see the brush settings for this tool. I'm gonna to click under brush tip shape. And the first thing I want you to see is a couple things. First of all, the size in pixels. So these are pixel based stamps, if you wanna call them that and this is where you adjust the size. So the size currently is 50, but I'll set it to 100 pixels. So when I paint, I get that result. So the original one was 50 pixels, the second one was 100 pixels. So what is actually going on? Well, if I change the spacing, you can actually see what we have when I paint. I just have circles. So the original stamp is just a circle, but when you squeeze it together and you paint, you create the illusion of painting a line. So that is very important to realize that in Photoshop brushes, what you're really dealing with is a stamp. In this case, I just have a circle. And in reality, what this is, is a square basically, more or less like that. And the outer areas are transparent and the shape that creates the circle is not. And all I'm doing is placing stamps on top of each other to create this effect. And with the brush settings, I get to make the adjustments that will um, affect that brush. So we already talked about size. So right now I have it set to 100. Let's talk a little bit about spacing because it's very important. Spacing is what determines how close or how far these stamps are next to each other. The closer you put them together, the more that they create the illusion of having, um, of, of creating a, a smooth straight line. And obviously the further away you separate them, the less that they look like a straight line. Now, what does that percentage mean? So spacing at 120%. 
that is the percentage that is relative to the size right up above. Right up here, you see this size, uh, the, the size, it's 100 pixels. So if I were to set it to say 100, set the spacing to 100, now when I paint, you'll get that effect there. The spacing now becomes 100% of whatever the size is up top. So when you when I click and drag, I'll paint once, and then Photoshop will take that one will take 100% of the size, which in this case is 100 pixels. And when I paint again, it'll paint right on the edge because we're doing 100% of the size on top. So if I change this to 50%, I'm pretty sure that you'll guess what's going to happen now. The circles are going to overlay on top of each other halfway through. So when I paint, you can see now that I create that effect there. The circles are basically, uh, when, when I paint with the brush, so I basically create one circle and then create another one right about here, right about the center. So that is the relationship between the spacing and the size. And if I go to 200%, then I'll look in the chat to see if you guys are paying attention. If I go to 200%, what do you guys think will happen? So at 200%, what do you think will happen? And let me take a look at the chat. And yeah, we have a lot of people watching from any everywhere. Oh man, I wish I could name everybody. Dubai, Belton, Texas, Netherlands, New Zealand, England, Kent, UK, Boston. I was just there a couple weeks ago, Pakistan, Riverside County. I lived in Riverside County for a little bit. Um, Kari from Finland, awesome, Orlando, Florida, cool. So there's a lot of a, a lot of stuff going. Uh, a lot of people watching from everywhere. So thank you so much for um, for letting me know where you're from. But um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching, Tyler. I see that you're in the chat. You're always leaving comments on my YouTube channel, so I appreciate that, Tyler. Thank you for watching. Um, but yeah, uh, people are saying that my audio is a little low. So let me get the microphone closer to me and let me know if that helps. Um, but anyway. So yeah, Brandon, you'll double the spacing. That's right. You got it, Brandon. Thank you for being the first person that uh, typed in the answer. So you'll, I'll double the spacing. So now when I paint, notice now that the spacing, and actually just to make it easier for you guys to see, when I paint, notice now that the spacing in between is basically the same size as the circle. See that? And this is all relative. So if I were to change the size to 50 pixels and then click and drag and paint, notice that the size in between the circles is the same as what I had before. See that? So that is just the basics of brushes. They're essentially a stamp and that stamp gets duplicated across the canvas depending on the settings that you set. And there's so many settings. We're going to look at a lot more settings and we're also going to look at how to create custom brushes and then, and then do some pretty advanced things. But once you understand this principle that you basically have a stamp a square and you overlay it on top of each other and you can rotate it and do all kinds of cool things that we'll look at in a moment. Once you understand that, you can pretty much do anything you want with brushes or maybe solve issues that you're having um, with brushes. So um, before we move forward, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, just briefly. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but I want to briefly talk about... Um, Oops, I made my brush way too big. I can also change the size here. We'll go back to 100. I briefly want to talk about opacity. When Notice that right now my opacity is set to 100%, and I'll create a new layer. And when I paint, you'll get the result that you would expect, opacity at 100%. If I change it to 50, I can paint. And notice that as I'm painting, I don't really make it any more black. I just keep painting at 50%. Flow, on the other hand, you can think of flow as almost like real paint, how much paint is flowing out of your brush. So at 100%, obviously, all of the paint comes out. But if I were to change this to, I'll change it to 1% so that you can see. If I were to change it to 1%, now when I paint, I'm building on that color. And actually, if I 1% might have been a little too low, so maybe we'll do 25. So notice that as I'm painting, I'm building the paint. I don't have to lift my mouse or my... Wacom tablet. So when I paint, the more I paint on the same area, the more it fills up. A lot like paint. So you start out soft, light, and then you can keep pushing, uh, keep painting over the same area to fill with more paint. Opacity, as I said before, doesn't do that. So I can change this to 39% or whatever, and I can keep going over the same area, and it will always be that same color unless I lift up my Wacom tablet or my stylus or mouse and then I can paint again. Lift up and then paint again. 
just to show that one more time with flow, I can actually, maybe I should do it with a lower flow. You can see that, that I, I don't have to lift up my stylus to, to build on that paint. So that's the difference between opacity and flow. So those are two other basics that are very important when, work, when working with brushes. And it, it looks like the audio is much better. I'm glad to hear. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's let's move on to the, the next thing so we can start looking at some of the other settings. We're going to do something that's a little more advanced, and that is, okay, that's great. So how do we create a brush? There's so many ways of creating brushes in Photoshop. I'm just going to show you a very simple way, and then we're going to look at different examples so that you get the idea. So whatever you have on your canvas, that can be, become a brush. It'll be black and white, or more accurately, it'll be solid or transparent or, you know, different levels of um, opacity, but you you technically can't have more than one color in, in the brush. And, and you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. Um, to create a brush, all you need to do is just have something on your canvas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my custom shape tool. And here's a different tip, uh, side tip. If you go into window and you go into shapes, make sure that you click on this flyout menu and select legacy shapes and more and that is going to load this folder here legacy shapes and more and it's going to have so many more custom shapes see that see how many more custom shapes we get we have a ton see that so much stuff so make sure that you enable that so that you can see the birds so we have birds here see we have all these birds and i guess i'll just use this bird right here i'll select it and this is very important my canvas is white so I need to paint with black. Black will be a solid color on the brush and any level of gray lower than black will be um, a lower level of opacity. So white is completely transparent and black will be completely solid. So I'm just going to click and drag and, you know, just get that bird in there. So that's my bird right there. So I can take that layer and go into edit, define brush preset. Notice here in the preview window that we have a square. See that square? That square right there, and it's 179 pixels on each side. That square is that stamp that I was talking about. This is the stamp that's going to be applied when I apply the brush stroke. And I'm just going to call it bird. There it is, bird. And notice that Photoshop automatically loads it as my default brush if you have the brush tool active. So I have the brush tool active, so it automatically loads it. So I can now create a new layer and I can paint my bird. See that? But it really doesn't look like a flock of birds because of the settings that I was discussing earlier. So I can click on this icon, which also brings the brush settings, or you can go into window and brush settings. And from here, we can start adjusting the brush tip shape. So I can click and drag on the spacing. See that? And you can see the preview window here at the bottom. So when I paint, you can see more birds. I can also... Um, um, go into the um, circle here and I can click and drag to rotate the birds. See that? But in newer versions of Photoshop, you can actually use the arrow keys on the keyboard. Um, let me just start painting here and you can see how in the preview it rotates. See how the preview is rotating now? And you can also see on the options bar right up here, the angle changing. So you can change the angle now with the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard and I think it's Photoshop 2021 in newer, maybe Photoshop 2020, somebody in the in the chat will let me know, but it's fairly new. So if you have something older in Photoshop 2020, unfortunately you cannot do this, but you will be able to come in here and just click and drag on this icon to, to rotate the birds or, or whatever your brush is. Um, something that we haven't looked at is all the other menus here on the left hand side. So I'm going to click on shape dynamics and this is a really, really cool one. I really like this. Let me know in the chat if you enjoy this one. Um, if I click and drag on the size jitter, now we're randomizing the size of the birds. So I'm just going to bump this up to 100%. Actually, 100% might be too much. We'll go 50. Right about here. Now, when I paint, notice that the birds are different sizes. See that? We have some smaller birds, some larger birds, and that's looking pretty cool. I can also come back in there and continue making adjustments. We can adjust the angle of the bird so that the birds have different angles so that they're all, all not facing the same angle. See that? Pretty cool. And I can also 
In this case, it really wouldn't make any sense, but I can adjust the uh, X jitter, so the X axis, so that some birds are facing left and other birds are facing right randomly. So when I paint, you'll notice that some birds face one way and uh, other birds face another way. It doesn't make sense in this brush, but you have that option. You also have the flip Y jitter, which is the same thing, but up and down. So some birds are facing up, other birds are facing down. Again, it really doesn't make much sense in this particular brush tip, but in some cases it works great. Um, what I will do in this case, I will also adjust the scattering so it scatters the birds um, from. So right now, when you know, when you notice it, when I paint a straight line, they're all pretty much on the same axis, right? They don't really go up and down too much. But when I adjust the or increase the scattering, notice now that they scatter more. See that? So the more that you increase the scatter, the more that they'll scatter from the center. So zero percent is right on the center, and then you can increase it so they scatter more. Um, let me go back into the brush tip and count jitter just basically uh, or count rather increases how many of those stamps are painted. See how I'm just painting so many more than what I had before. So now we can create really create a flock of birds or something like that. So now that's probably a lot of birds. I don't I don't think I want that many. So maybe let me reduce the the count, maybe something like that. Still too many. Maybe I need to increase the spacing a little bit more and the scattering. I really don't need that many. So maybe something like that. So maybe maybe that works. So, okay, great. So now we have birds. Well, what can we use these birds for? We can use them for anything. So I know that in here I have photos of skies and stuff like that. So maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to, maybe in this, I don't know, we have this cool, really cool 3D illustration that I downloaded from Adobe Stock. So let me open that up. And maybe you just want to add some birds to the scene. So then there we go. We have some birds. And obviously, they would have to be the a color that matches the, uh, the scene. So in this case, I would just hit Colorize and maybe, you know, select a, a blue or something and adjust the saturation and and try to get something that matches matches that, that sky. But the point is, is that you have you now have a flock of birds in, in your scene and, and you can adjust that any way that you want. Um, so that's how you would create a brush, but we can also get even more creative and create many, many different types of brushes with these settings and that's what we're gonna do next. But let me just take a quick look at the chat just in case I missed anything. Um, cool, we have also Tyler from Boston, awesome. We have people from the Philippines, India, cool. When and why should I use spacing? Okay, Jose, so it all depends on what you're working on, right? Like in this example with the birds, it depends on what you want. So maybe you only want a few birds, right? Or maybe you want a lot of, um, if you wanted a few birds and spacing is a way to go because you have, um, you know, you don't, you don't paint that many birds. But if you wanted a larger flock of birds, maybe you reduce the spacing and also increase the, um, the count and now you have a flock of birds. So obviously that's way too many, but that's one of the reasons. Um, one of the reasons you saw it earlier, if you are working with um, just a regular brush, like a solid brush, like this one here, you know, you can get a, a very straight line, you know, with low spacing. But if your spacing is higher, then you might not get a fully straight line. You know, you might get that effect there. So you might want that or you might not. It all depends on what you're doing. So you have to think about how you want these stamps to be stacked on top of each other as you paint and what the result that you want and then just adjust the, the spacing accordingly. Let's see. So yes, that's another uh, good point. Um, Oh, I'm trying to give the proper credit here. Um, and I'm sorry, but I mispronounced your name. Quinique's Creativities said that another way of selecting brushes, and that's true, is by right-clicking on it as you have the brush tool selected, and you can just select it from here. Very, very good tip. Um, how come every time Photoshop updates, I have to load my brush presets again? So... I'm trying to be very careful on, on how I answer this. I think that from future updates, unless something changes, um, you shouldn't have to do that anymore. 
Um, I don't re I, I believe that there's now preset syncing in updates in Photoshop, but let's just assume that, that that's not the case. And, and the reason that it used to happen in the past is that um, every new version of Photoshop, so not every update. So when you went from Photoshop, say, you know, 2019 to 2020, or, or you skip one and you went from 2019 to 2021, that's a whole new version of Photoshop. So you would lose, uh, not lose, the setting, the brushes would still be in the folder for the old version of Photoshop. So it's a whole new installation of Photoshop. So that's why the brushes didn't automatically get transferred over. But something that I always recommended people to do is in the libraries panel, you should create a library that um, contains your, your favorite brushes. So, you know, with any library, all you need to do is click and drag on a brush from the brushes panel. So from the brushes panel here, you can click and drag a brush onto the libraries panel and it will always be in the libraries panel and you can use the brush that's in that libraries panel on all your insta installations of Photoshop. So whether it updates or it doesn't update, it doesn't matter, it's always in the libraries panel. And that's a good way of maintaining like your top favorite brushes that you use all the time uh, in in um, the libraries panel and so that you have access to it from your laptop or iPad or wherever you want. So that's that's one thing that you can do to, to keep your uh, brushes organized. Uh, let me see. Cool. Awesome. So let's continue. So now let's take a look at another example. I'm going to go into the um, um, libraries panel here. And I know that I have in this library some clouds. And there we go. This is going to work great. So I'm going to open up this image here. And we have a photo of clouds, right? So I want to create a cloud, smoke, fog type of brush. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this image into black and white control shift u command shift u on the mac to desaturate you can also go into image adjustment desaturate and there's a keyboard shortcut shift control u or shift command u on the mac and it desaturates so remember what i said before black is the paint and white is the canvas if you will so white will become transparent and black will become solid so if i were to make a brush out of this then the sky will be solid and the cloud itself will be transparent. So I want the opposite of that. So control I on Windows, command I on the Mac to invert. So now the cloud is black and the sky is a light gray. We want to make it even lighter. So I can go into image adjustment levels and just crush the whites. See that? So now the background is, is pretty much white and the foreground is pretty much black. And I can come in here with the dodge tool and I can dodge my highlights, not the midtones or shadows, just the highlights so that this is all transparent and it doesn't actually show up as, as a cloud, something like this. And in some cases, you may actually just want to select the brush tool and just paint with white on the areas that you really don't want to be part of your brush. So I'm just painting on everything that I don't want to be part of my brush. And just to show you, in some cases, what I do is just select the lasso tool like this and then just invert the selection and fill with white to make sure that nothing outside of that is, is black or has a level of gray. So this, is become, this will become my brush. I can go into edit, define, um, well, it needs to be, let me unlock the layer here and then go into edit. Uh, why? Wait a minute. I am now having an issue. Why is see? I even have problems. Why am I having a problem? So edit. It's not letting me. Somebody there's gonna tell me in the chat, and I'm gonna be like, oh my god, I can't believe I didn't think about that. Um, am I in an RGB? See, things happen to me all the time. So I'm in the RGB color mode. It's eight bits. And if I go, is it too large? Is that the problem? Image size. Let me just do fifty percent of that. It may, might be too large. Yep, that, it, that was a problem. It was too large. So see, like sometimes I also have to troubleshoot because I'm like, wait, why isn't this working? The canvas was just a little too large. So I made it 50% smaller and, and that fixed it. So now I can go into the fine brush preset and you can see um, my brush tip here and I can call it clouds and press OK. So now if I go into my previous document and 
I just I have way too many layers, so let me just delete them. You can select layers by holding shift and clicking on the top one, and then while holding shift, clicking on the bottom one, it will select all in between, and I tapped on the backspace key on Windows, that's the delete key on the Mac to delete all those layers. So now I have basically a clean canvas here. So with that brush that I just made, um, I can paint with black, and you see what I create there. But I can reduce the size, and this doesn't look like smoke or smog or anything like that. So how can we make it look like all that other good stuff? Well, using that same brush settings, I can go into the brush settings here, increase the spacing. I can go into shape dynamics. We already talked about size jitter. And I do want to flip the X jitter and Y jitter this time because I just want completely random stamps here. I don't want them all looking the same. I also am going to increase the angle jitter so that they're all facing a different way. So when I paint now, you will see the result. See that? It's looking much, much better. So I can come in here now and then maybe go into the scattering and increase the scatter a little bit and increase the count. And now that's my result. And maybe bring down the spacing. Maybe I took the spacing um, up too much. So that, that looks a little bit better. So now I can use this as a smog or smoke type of brush. So let me see what kind of photo I have here that we can use this with. So maybe I think we will be able to do something with this. Maybe there's some, you know, some mist or fog on this image. So I can create a new layer. I'll, I'll start with white. And I'm just going to paint here. And actually, you know what? I'm not happy. So I can come back into my brush settings and maybe adjust what what am I unhappy with maybe the size jitter maybe the you know what I think I I think I may have to go into the transfer and adjust the opacity jitter so that they all have different opacity see that see in the preview here right now they're all at 100% opacity but now I can adjust the opacity jitter so that they all have different opacities so when I paint I'm going to get this result here and that looks more like clouds and I think I like that much better. So I can just come in here and just paint my my fog or mist or whatever it is. And I know that doesn't look that good, but I can go into the hue and saturation adjustment layer, click on this icon to clip it on the layer below, click on colorize and then just, you know, colorize it so that it, you know, matches my scene better. I don't know in this case. What do you guys think? Maybe like a bluish type of color. I don't know, something like that. And of course, I can always reduce the opacity and, and, and you know, do all that all that fun stuff to get my, my cloud or my uh, fog going. And also, you know what? Maybe if this, this here was like a chimney right here, I can just, you know, that's just like some smoke coming out or something like that. And I can also lock the transparent pixels by clicking on this icon or pressing the question mark key. And that's on North American keyboards. You guys that are watching in other countries, let me know if the question mark actually locks transparency or not. It's also the forward slash key, the one next to the shift key on the bottom right. So at least the North American keyboards, that's the keyboard shortcut for locking or unlocking transparent pixels. So that means that I can now only paint on pixels that are solid. And I can, you know, maybe come in here, reduce the opacity and the flow a little bit, and then just paint with the black on here too you know, create that smoke effect coming out of the, out of the chimney there. See that? So and that's not even a chimney. I'm just pretending that, that, that that's one. But as you can see, creating your own custom brushes gives you so much flexibility and it allows you to apply all sorts of effects to your images. Let me see if we have uh, more questions in the chat. So Anita said, I download and use brushes a lot, but I'm not confident in creating my own. I'll think I'll be brave and dive in. I'm from Virginia. Yeah, Anita, you definitely should just try it out. Even if you're downloading other brushes, you can, with the knowledge that you that you gather by creating your own brushes, even if you don't like them, you will be able to take the brushes that you download and adjust the settings to make them even better. So I highly encourage everybody watching to go ahead and just try it and see what happens. And at the very least, you learn what the settings do and you can always adjust the brushes that you download. Cool. Awesome. 
Oh, actually, uh, mini donkeys just asked the question about something I was going to show next. How do I make brush to resemble animal hair? So we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Okay, so good question here. So I'm going to go into the um, brushes here. And um, so the question was, how do I, like, after I made this brush, like, how do I save it? You can go into this flyout menu and, and just create a new brush preset. And you can adjust the, or you can set the name. You can capture the brush size in the preset. And you can include the color. So in this case, it will be black if I check this box and press OK. And it'll save that preset. So this is how you save the brush after you made all these adjustments. So very good question. Oh, yeah. People, <laughs> people were talking about my, my facial hair. Yeah, you know what? Like for whatever reason, I, I've always shaved almost daily. And then for about two weeks, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to shave and see what happens. So yeah, this is what I look like with facial hair. And I can't even grow like a full beard. Like I, I have, I don't know, just, just, this is probably the, the most facial hair, hair you guys will ever see on me. Um, cool. Um, can I explain opacity? Uh, Louis, I talked about that in the beginning, so you can watch the recording and, and, and go back to it. But basically, opacity controls just the level of paint that you see on screen. And that doesn't change unless you lift up the stylus or paint over again, letting go of the mouse button and painting over again, while flow builds on the paint. So without lifting the mouse or without lifting the stylus, you can add more paint and make pixels darker paint. Cool. Can I make it blurry? So, I mean, you can make it blurry twice uh, in two ways, right? You can make it blurry by once you have your your image or your smoke there, you can go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and then you can blur it as much as you want, which is probably the way that I would do it. Or you could also come in here and go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and just make a blurry cloud. But I probably wouldn't do that just in case I needed a sharper cloud. Um, or maybe you can have two brushes, one with, you know, sharpness and one that is pretty blurry. Totally up to you. Cool. Um, let's now work on, let me see. Okay, one other thing I wanted to tell you guys just before I forget. Um, so you guys see these locks here? Do you guys know what those do? Um, you can type it up in the chat if you know uh, what they do. Um, but basically, these padlocks will lock the specific settings that you have on here for the next brush. So for example, if I were to set my size jitter to 30% and I wanted, you know, zero angle jitter and single zero roundness jitter and not have anything flipped on all my brushes. So basically the only setting I want is 30% size jitter. I can lock this. And when I change brushes, you know, I'll change it to like my bird brush and I come back in there Notice that I, I have my bird brush, but the size jitter is still at 30%. See that? This is the bird here. So it's just locking that setting for the any brush that you have. So again, I'll, I'll select a new brush. So I'm going to go into a different brush. I'm going to go into this one called hair. I'll go back into brush settings and notice that that's the hair brush, but the size jitter is still 30%. So you're locking the settings in this particular area um, on all the brushes that, that you select. So... If you don't want to do that, you can unlock it. And then when you select a different brush, if the brush has a different size jitter, um, it, it'll change. If, it's, if it doesn't, like in this case, see that? See how this brush didn't have any shape dynamics, no size jitter? So then it doesn't have anything on there. So that, that's basically what the padlocks do. Cool. Let's um, now. Somebody was asking about hair, but before I get into that, let me talk a little bit about our good friends at MSI right here. Good friends at MSI, thank you so much for sponsoring today's video. Um, usually I have this cool graphic that shows the monitors and uh, everything else that I'm using, but I have new equipment, so the only thing that I'm using. Um, right now that's the same as before is the desktop. I'm using the Aegis TI-5 uh, computer. This is the computer that I'm using to stream this video. So I highly recommend it if you're looking for a powerful computer. It's super, super fast and it works great with um, all the Adobe applications that I use. I have a new laptop that I'm using from MSI. 
which is this one right here. And I'm just going to show you the website. I started using it about two weeks ago as a Creator Z16, and it has a GeForce RTX 30 series, uh, series um, processor. It's a really, really nice looking laptop, but forget the nicest. The performance on it, the processor is fantastic. A couple of cool things for those of you that are doing um, design is that it has a 16 by 10 monitor. So it gives you that extra room on the monitor so that, or the, the screen, I should say, the extra room on the screen so that you can see more panels and things like that as you're working. So that's actually really, really beneficial. So you don't have to scroll up and down so much. It also has a touch screen, which it's, it's super cool. Like I, I was never really a big fan of touch screens, but now I just, you know, just tap on something or like scroll or zoom in or pinch and zoom and do things like that. So um, it, it's a fantastic laptop. Like I said, I've been using it for about two weeks and it's replacing my Creator 15 laptop. So the Creator Z16 is the new laptop from MSI, high resolution, um, Kalman Vertify, uh, true color display, great color accuracy. Each of these laptops is um, calibrated at factory. They have fast video cards. So yeah, check them out. And also the new monitor that I have, and I don't even have it uh, on screen because I just opened this one up not too long ago, but is the, let me just, bring it up and show it to you guys here. So the new monitor that I'm using is a Creator PS32 One URV. This is a 4K monitor and it's got, again, fantastic resolution. It looks great. It's Adobe RGB. It's 99% Adobe RGB. Um, so it it's just a fantastic monitor and it looks great. So I recommend that you check it out. This is the monitor here on my right, the one I'm currently using. So thank you MSI for sponsoring today's session and for all of the amazing products that you do. The link to these products are in the description. So make sure that you check those out. Cool. So I, like I was saying, somebody was asking about um, animal and fur and all of that. So there's a lot of ways in which you can do that. I've sh In my YouTube channel, I've shown ways that you can take a brush that's already in there, modify it a, a little bit to create uh, a fur brush. But why don't we create one from scratch? So let me just close all these tabs because, you know, we don't really need th these many tabs and I'll delete these layers. And you can create, like I said, you can create brushes any way that you want. Another thing that you can do is you can select something like the curvature pen tool and create something like this, like a triangle type thing. Then you can double click on the tips here, like so, and just bring these really close to each other and then maybe click here to add a point, drag to the side, click here to add a point, and this will be the hair. There you go. And then you can move that, oops, let me select the path selection tool and I can move that. It doesn't matter where you place it, but I just want it in the center, so there it is. And if you select one of these tools or one of these tools, you can always right click on a path and select fill path. Let me create a new layer for it before I do that. Select fill path path and I'll fill it with black and select black from the drop the drop down and from the path panel I'm just going to click away from it so that the path is no longer active and go back into the layers panel so there you go that's my my fur brush so I can go into edit and select define brush preset and I'll just call it fur hair it doesn't really matter and press OK and as you can see, there it is. That's my fur. Obviously, that doesn't look much like fur. So we need to go into the brushes settings and, you know, maybe adjust the spacing a little bit, go into shape dynamics and increase the size jitter so that they're not all the same. Angle jitter, just a little bit of an angle adjustment. And I think this will work great. Maybe increase the count a little bit to get more fur like so, and maybe just a little bit of scattering, not too much, just a tiny little bit. Maybe maybe even increase the count even more, maybe four. And then I'm gonna use the Wacom tablet now just to try it out. And that looks pretty good, I would say. So what I can do now is just, you know, use this to create fur. I can use it to paint fur or to use it for um, like a, a mask. So let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to now 
go into the libraries panel and I have a photo of a dog in here. I'm sure I, I'm sure that I have a dog in here. So I'm just going to type in the word dog and we'll select this dog. This one, oops, this one here works great. And I'll, I'll show you how you can use this brush we just made to create a mask. So I'm going to go into the properties panel, make sure that my layer is unlocked from the properties panel. Now I have this remove background button. This will use Adobe Sensei artificial intelligence to um, find the, the main subject, in this case, the dog and make a mask around it. Now the problem is that the fur doesn't look very realistic. See that? See how it doesn't really work? So what I can do is go into the lasso tool and just select the areas that I want to adjust like so not the not the head I can do that in a separate adjustment so just make that selection with the layer mask selected I can go into filter other minimum and I can use the minimum filter to contract that mask and I have a video that talks all about the minimum and maximum filter if you want to check it out it's on my YouTube channel and just reduce the radius until you you know you go pretty far in so that you can use the brush that we just created to paint the fur back in. So I'm just trying to find like a good spot here. So maybe we'll just go, I don't know, maybe too much, maybe 23 or something. That still might be too much. We'll just leave it at 20, no matter what I get. Yeah, 20 would be good. So what I can do now is come in here and paint with white, not black, to reveal the fur. Obviously, that doesn't look very good. Why? Well, the fur needs to be facing the other way. So I can go back into my brush settings under um, shape dynamics or brush tip rather. I can flip X like so and that maybe look better. Actually, and that's not going to work. I think I was I had it fine before. So what I'm going to do is actually rotate my brush. So let me just use the bracket keys to adjust the brush size and then the arrow keys to rotate the brush. Yeah, that's going to look much better. So I'm just trying to match the fur here and I'm rotating the brush. Yeah, that's going to that's going to work great. Yeah, perfect. So I can now go into my shape dynamics and select an, uh, on angle jitter, just choose direction so that it follows the direction that I'm going when I paint like so and I can just build upon that oops and I don't want to go up I was actually you know what in this case I don't need my my angle jitter I can just go up and down like this and I know this might seem like it'll take a while and it doesn't look that good but if I create a new solid color layer Fill it with black that way you can see the contrast you can see what i'm doing there I'm, I'm just creating that fur and it might not even be that uh it's probably a bit too small so maybe i'll make it larger so i'll continue painting here like so it just depends on on what you want you know and you can just spend your time doing this however you need to and i'm just gonna just avoid having these you know what one thing that I should have done, I'm going to go back because now I changed my mind on something. Something I should have done before I did all of this is when I contracted my brush here, um, I should have kept that um, that selection and just go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur, just so that I can blur the edges and they're, they don't have really, so that the dog doesn't have sharp edges. So something like, oops, and I'm blurring the the, the inside of, so this is a weird thing. When you have um, a mask selected, you can go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and then I don't blur the, the actual layer because I had the layer selected. So that's why I was blurring the dog, but I'm trying to blur the mask, not the dog. So with the mask selected, I can decide how much blur I want. I just don't want that sharp edge. You see that? So I just want to find a right level of blur like so and then I can go and do what I was doing before with that brush select that I can come in here and paint that fur, uh, fur back in but with black like so and that will give me a much better result I was doing it the long way 
earlier i would have to like done a lot of painting but i think you get the idea and then you can decide you know how much and i'm using the bracket keys on the keyboard by the way because i want a lot of fur in some areas and then less fur in other areas and you can paint in accordingly and i know that some of you may be thinking well that's cool but like you're still getting a lot of that green on the edges here from from the background like what do we do there well, if you want to fix that, what you can do is just make a, a selection of that area, like so. Press Control J on Windows, Command J on the Mac. Clip it to the layer below. Oops, wrong, wrong keyboard shortcut, Control Alt G. And then move it to the right, or left in this case, sorry. Left, and then hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click on the layer mask icon to make a black layer mask. So now, with the brush tool, you can go into a regular soft brush and just paint in the areas that don't, you know, the, the fur basically. So see that, see how I'm just painting in the fur in those areas so that we don't get so much of that green and I'm actually using the same fur from the dog. I'm just moving it to the left a little bit and then revealing it selectively. But that's one of the ways that you would do something like this. And obviously you would take the time of, of going through the entire dog and painting in the fur, trying to match the actual angle of the fur and use this brush with different sizes and, and different rotations to try to match it also. It, it'll take you some time, but this will give you great results. Cool. Um, the keyboard uh, shortcut for, um, if you have a brush tool selected and you press uh, number on your keypad for example five would change the opacity to 50 percent zero zero will be a hundred percent one will be 10 two will be 20 three will be um oh by the way uh, so what i was trying to say there is if, if you know three will be 30 but if you do them pretty fast like one five you get 15 or like eight six 86 but you have to do it fast and if you just do one and then wait a second then it'll just be that whole number so like six will be 60 and then wait and press seven and that'll be 70. But if you do six and seven fast, it'll be 67% on the opacity. Um, also, so so yeah, so you can, you can uh, check those out. Um, but anyway, um, let me see. We don't have a lot of time and I, there's a couple of things I wanted to show you. So let me see. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about color. Um, I'm just trying to think of like the best way I can show it to you in like 10 minutes. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. So if I select a color here, the, the color really doesn't matter, so I'll select red, right? And I paint on a new layer, and actually let me make sure that red is my foreground color and white is my background color. So when I paint, you know, I get that result. Why? Because flow is at 56 and opacity is at whatever it was. But now when I paint, I get this result. And actually for this example, it's better if I have a solid color. Here's another keyboard shortcut. Um, if you, so what I did now is I have soft edges and I wanted hard edges. So if you hold shift in the right and left bracket keys on the keyboard, you can decrease or increase the hardness of the brush. See that? So shift and right bracket key will give you hard edges. But anyway, so painting with red, fantastic. So if you go into the brush settings, there's an option called color dynamics. When you enable that and you paint, you get that result. Why? Well, the settings that I have here is brightness jitter at 57%. We'll talk about what that means in a moment, but I'm just gonna reduce this to 0%. And when I paint, I get this result. Why do I get that result? Because I have this checkbox on, apply per tip, foreground and background jitter. My foreground and background are red and white. So now I get a combination of those colors ranging from white all the way to red. See that? That's why I get that result there. If I uncheck this, what I will get is just that color that you see there. That's all I get. So I'm gonna leave the apply per tip um, setting on. Another thing that you can do with that control 
is adjust the hue. So let me adjust it by maybe say 10%. And when I paint, actually let me let me uncheck per tip, the apply per tip. So when I paint, I get that result that you see there, right? It's basically red, you know? And if I go into the hue jitter and I increase it to say, I don't know, 60, and I paint, I'm gonna get different colors. See that? All these different colors. The colors are jittering. What does that mean? Well, when I go into the color picker, you can see that the red is here. And if I increase the jitter, it's gonna catch more of the color. So probably I'm catching all the way up to here because I see a lot of magentas in there. Actually, no, I see these darker colors. So maybe all the way down here. So that jitter is now selecting all the colors that are in this range and maybe all the way up to here in the yellow. So all these colors. Uh, to make it more obvious, I'm gonna select this cyan color here. And when I paint, you can see all the different colors that it jitters through. See that? All these different color colors that it jitters through. So that means that that percentage, and I forget what it was. Let me let me go back and, and, and see what that was. I, I had it basically at 60%. We said, well, just say, uh, yeah, 60% almost, 59. So basically what this is doing is it's taking this color and moving it up almost 60% and moving it down almost 60%. So you can see that it gets a little bit of the yellows because you can see some of the yellows here, this yellow greens, and it gets some of the magentas right up here. You can see that there. So that's what that is doing. This is just adjusting the hue up and down on that percentage value. The cool thing is that when you enable the apply per tip foreground and background color, you get this effect that you see there. See that? Super, super cool. And actually, um, you might be thinking, well, why, why is this useful? Well, if you select a different type of a brush, like maybe a splatter brush or something like that, I don't know, would this one work? Let me see if this one will work. Yeah, this is this should be a good one. So when you have that a splatter a splatter brush like that, you can create you know this effect you see here, and I'll enable the color dynamics, and maybe keep the hue jitter at that that area. So when I paint, you get that cool effect you see here. See that? See that looks much more organic, looks more realistic, and I can select a different color. Maybe I don't know, maybe orange, and do the same thing. See that? You get that cool effect you see there. So that's one way in which you can use this tool. And actually maybe 60 might be too much. Maybe do like 28 or something. And then maybe increase the flow so we get more of those colors. But see that? See the cool effect that you can you can get? It, lo it looks much more realistic, much more organic. And you can probably guess by now that you can also increase the brightness jitter. So that controls the darkness. So see that? So you get this cool black orange effect because we're jittering from the color that we have all the way to to black and you can create really cool textures and i'm sure that you're able to guess by now the saturation jitter just does the same thing but with saturation so you can control the different components so you can create really really cool effects just by adjusting these sliders so the hue one is probably one of the ones that you'll use the most especially if you're working with like textures and things like that and to be frank with you you probably wouldn't even adjust the hue that much maybe i don't know maybe something like 15 or so and then when you paint you basically just get the color that you selected and just a small variation of that color you know for for whatever it is that you're painting let me see if there's any other questions in the chat Is there a way to make a brush only use four different? Um, you know what, John? Actually, that's a very good question. I don't think that you can select just from four specific. Well, I mean, you could use a mixer brush for that, but I'm not sure if that will answer your question, John. So in this particular with this particular technique, you wouldn't be able to. Um, you you wouldn't be able to specify four specific colors unless there's something in there that I'm not aware of um, but no um, you can technically do that with the mixer brush um, but yeah 
Oh, good, good question. Um, really good question in the chat, uh, Reggie. Where is the best place for brush packages? If you're in, if if you're a member of the Creative Cloud, you can go into the gear menu and select Get More Brushes, and that will bring up this window that you see here, and it's gonna load all these brushes you can download for free. So this is a fantastic, fantastic resource. It's um, over a thousand free brushes. They're .abr files, Adobe Photoshop uh, brush files from Kyle T. Webster. They're fantastic, so you can check them out. I actually really enjoy the splatter ones and also the uh, concept brushes also has some good stuff in there. So I, uh, I would recommend that you download those. And you can see that the splatter brush that I used here for this example is one of those brushes from, from that pack. Cool. Um, the question is, how can you make custom brushes? We were doing this, that the whole time, just basically whatever you have in Canvas, edit, um, define brush preset and adjust the settings that we've been adjusting. So basically er everything that we talked about. Let me see if there's anything else here that I want to talk about before we go. We have about maybe less than five minutes. Um, I think we cover all the basics. Obviously there's a lot more. There's a lot of different options that we really didn't, uh, touch. But I, you know what? Here, I have an idea. I'll show you one other thing. If you go in, if you have a, a tech, because we're talking about textures, right? So I think I have some textures here. So if you have something like, like I don't know, like this, this here. And I wanted to create like a cracked brush. You can use something like this. Again, same thing I did earlier. Control Shift U on Windows. Command Shift U on the Mac to desaturate. And it just helps, helps me see things better. And I can go into Image, Adjustment Levels, and just try to make everything white except for the cracks, something like that. And I'll do what I did before. I'll make a selection around the areas that I want to keep. So I don't know, something like this. Everything else doesn't look that good in, to my eye. And I can just go into right click, select inverse and fill that with white. White is my background color. So I can press control backspace on Windows, command delete on the Mac. So this could probably be a good brush. Let me just select the brush tool and paint with white with a soft brush just to make sure that I don't have any edges, any hard edges. So like right up here, I might have some hard edges, change the mode to normal. I didn't talk about blending modes with brushes, but basically they work very similar to the blending modes on the layers panel. There's two different uh, blending modes found here that are not in the layers panel clear, which is basically the eraser tool and behind that allows you to paint only in transparent pixels. Um, but anyway, so I'm just painting here just to not to have any hard edges. And this could be my brush. So I can go into edit, define brush preset, and you can see my brush there. I can just call this cracks like so. And there it is. So now you can see that when I paint, I get, let me create a new layer actually and press X to swap the foreground and background color. And I can get that result, but that doesn't look very good. So again, we can go into the brushes settings and maybe adjust the spacing, adjust the size jitter, the angle jitter for sure. So that they're all facing different ways. And then the Y and X jitter, and then we get that result there. So see that? So we start getting this really cool texture to create cracks and uh, the stressed areas in a photo. See that? See how cool that is? Super, super cool. So, you know, and you can use um, like a photo, right? I have a photo here of, um, I think I have a photo of like a painting or something that I could use. This one here, yeah. So let me just crop it because I only really want the painting. So if I wanted to create like cracks or something on that painting, I can use that brush, right? Create my layer and then just, you know, paint on that to create cracks, right? Super cool. Actually, that one's a little too big. And what I can also do is actually with the brush tool, we make it a little smaller and just add a few more. Now nah, that one's too much, maybe that one there, cool. And what I can now do is take advantage of layer styles. So I can double click to the side of the layer and click on bevel and emboss, and then just make adjustments to try to make it seem like 
you know, those are actual cracks. So maybe instead I can just use the global lighting and adjust it accordingly until it looks like I have um, cracks. I'm going to bring down the fill opacity so that the only colors that I see are the colors that are created by the layer style. So bringing down the fill opacity to zero will only make the colors or the pixels that you create from this panel visible on that layer. All the other pixels will not be visible. So that's why we can't see the original black. And that way I can just control everything here. So this now looks not necessarily like cracks. It just it looks like it's uh, racing up, you know. And if I go into the bevel and emboss option, I can click on down and now it looks more like cracks. And again, you can spend as much time as you want fine tuning this and maybe change the blending mode to like overlay. And then maybe on color overlay, you know, select a different color, maybe like a darker blue or something. Totally up to you. It just depends on, on the effect that you're going for. But this is something that you can do just by creating brushes. And we did it very quickly. I did it while talking and also looking at the comments. But um, before we go, remember to check out our sponsors at MSI. They make these streams possible. The links to their products are below in the description. I will be back again for another episode next week, and I have another tutorial coming up for you guys very, very soon, so stay tuned for that. Make sure that you click on that like button if you enjoyed any of the tips and tricks that I showed you today, and let me know in the chat what those were. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you again very, very soon. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend.